that's what I need to remember when writing like scripted things is like, do not have sentences longer than five words. <laughs> Hi, welcome to Flywheel Fridays, keeping up with the federal IT news cycle, one conversation at a time. I'm Alexander Bolova, media producer for GovCIO Media and Research. With me today are my wonderful co-hosts, Deputy Editor Kate Macri and Staff Writer Sarah Seibert. Kate and Sarah, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us, Alex. Thanks, Alex. Federal Cybersecurity. It's a topic that we've discussed previously on the podcast, and one that's only growing in relevance and importance. Every week, it feels like there's a major update or breaking news story. And frankly, it's a lot to keep up with. Our upcoming in-person event, Cyberscape Zero Trust, will explore the many advances and priorities in the field. But we wanted to take today's episode to discuss the current state of cybersecurity and what to expect in our panel conversations next week. To kick off our conversation... Kate and Sarah, you were both at the Billington Cybersecurity Summit earlier this month. What were some of your top takeaways from the event? Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Alex. I would say that one of the top takeaways I had from the summit and some of the earlier conferences I attended this summer were a lot of federal agencies are developing new cyber workforce strategies. So federal agencies are challenged with resources to remain competitive in the rapidly expanding cyber and tech workforce. Bolstering the federal cyber workforce is a huge overarching priority for federal agencies as the demand for cyber professionals continues to overcome supply. To address the talent gap, federal agencies are introducing new programs and strategies. And during Billington Cybersecurity Summit, DOD CIO John Sherman said that the cyber workforce is our generation's space race. Sherman added that DOD will introduce a new cyber workforce strategy, and that's mostly going to come out within the next two months, to improve not only the cyber workforce, but also positions across the STEM field. And the strategy aims to broaden and diversify DOD's workforce. Additionally, many federal agencies are targeting younger age groups like middle and high schoolers to increase awareness of cyber and STEM positions earlier in students' career paths. Also, at the 930 Gov conference in August, VA CIO Kurt Delbeni said his agency wasn't spending enough, saying that the salaries within federal government make it really challenging to hire full-time cyber experts. So Delbeni is working to raise pay for cyber professionals to remain competitive with industry salaries. Kate, what have you noticed recently? So I think one of the strongest narratives to come out of the Billington Cyber Summit in particular was Jen Easterly, director of CISA, and Chris Inglis, who is the national cyber director, saying that cyber defense is the new offense. And it, it sounds like a weird thing to say, but I think the reason why they're like pushing like that particular little tagline about federal cybersecurity is because most of the time when people used to think about cyber, they would think about, you know, cyber warfare and hackers and playing cyber defense just kind of seemed like this thing that everyone should be doing and it's not very fun to do. And also like the hackers are the cool ones who get movies made about them. And they're trying to make cyber defense in Jen Easterly's words, sexy again. So I thought that was a really fun way to describe it, especially because I think the other reason for describing it that way is because, like Sarah was saying, the cybersecurity workforce shortage is a really big problem right now, not just in the public sector, but also in the private sector. There just aren't enough people in cyber jobs. And as an industry, cybersecurity is only going to continue to grow as more and more organizations rely on the cloud and on software to do, like, basically all, like, basic job functions. So it's a pretty big deal. And I thought that was a really interesting way to talk about it. Another really interesting takeaway from the summit, also coming from Jen Easterly, was 
how CISA is seeking input for their Cyber Incident Reporting Council. So earlier this year, Congress mandated cyber incident reporting to CISA within 48 hours, and that's for all critical infrastructure sectors, all private companies in those sectors, and also federal agencies. And that was part of the budget bill. So now CISA is interested in getting some input from industry for the rulemaking process and also because they're setting up a council and around cyber incident reporting and they're trying to find a way to make this something easy for federal agencies and companies to do and not something that's burdensome and like this extra like, you know, bit of like bureaucratic like paperwork and processes that people have to go through that's really annoying and no one really wants to do. So that was some other big news that came out of Billington that I thought was super interesting. Um, and then the final thing from Billington that I wanted to highlight was DOD announced their five-year zero trust strategy. So DOD CISO David McKeown talked a little bit about how they have 90 capabilities that they are going to define what he described as targeted zero trust and then an additional 62 capabilities that will define a more advanced zero trust approach for applicability on critical national security systems. And my question would be if that's going to be getting into like the classified and unclassified DOD networks, just because that seemed to be jiving a little bit with DISA's recent announcement to extend their Thunderdome zero trust prototype by about six months so that they could develop a zero trust approach to cybersecurity for their classified network, CIPRNET, in addition to the unclassified network. So anyway, a big part of all of this is workforce development. At the 2022 Intelligence and National Security Summit last week, DOD Deputy CIO Dr. Kelly Fletcher talked a lot about how zero trust is a major priority for the department, which is pretty obvious at this point. But also, she talked a lot about how data management and developing the workforce are really part and parcel to that. They're really important to making all of these big plans that they have a reality. The new chief digital and AI officer at DOD, Dr. Craig Martell, said that the workforce is really his big, like number one priority right now. He's trying to incorporate more telework flexibility and make DOD more of an attractive job to job seekers because, you know, a lot of the times people think about DOD as like a, having this hire to retire like workforce model. You know, like you get a job in DOD, you work there your whole life until you retire. And that's like it. And you go to the Pentagon every day. <laughs> and Martel's trying to get away from that because, and I think this applies to the cybersecurity workforce and the AI workforce um, and just general like IT work workforce. He's trying to get away from that because it's not very conducive to what workers want. They want to diversify their careers and they want to be able to try new things and they want to be able to do new things and have more like creative freedom and mobility. And people want to be able to like do a government stint for a little bit and then go to industry and then maybe come back to government. And he wants to allow for that so that they can have improved talent and also so that Silicon Valley will be more interested in hiring people from DOD. Because like his whole argument is if DOD can take new hires and make them even better at their jobs, whether that be cybersecurity or AI, then Silicon Valley is going to try and poach them from DOD instead of the other way around. And then DOD will be seen as a good like stepping stone in whatever career you're trying to develop, which I thought was a really like unique take on it, especially for DOD. I know Sarah was also at Billington Cyber Summit and has some interesting things to say about software supply chains and software security. Sarah? Yeah, it's interesting what you were saying about the workforce. One metaphor I've been hearing a lot across like VA, my beats, um, some of the cyber agencies too, like CISA, but uh, they're like creating this uh, revolving door. That's the metaphor I've been, where people can just like come in, stay a couple of years, go back out and just like keep that cycle going. But as you were talking about the zero trust, DOD's five-year zero trust strategy, it made me think a lot about securing the supply chain uh, and SBOMs, which has been 
the new buzzword that I've been hearing lately. Uh, so large scale vulnerabilities discovered in Log4j, SolarWinds and more have really prompted federal cybersecurity leaders to know what's under the hood of their applications. Uh, so to do that, agencies are using SBOMs to drive resiliency and security management. So SBOM is basically like a list of ingredients that goes into software, which will promote transparency across software acquisition and development, as well as better defined cyber risk responsibility. So during Billington, CISA senior advisor and strategist Alan Friedman explained how SBOMs enable organizations to quickly respond to threats, uh, which will drive cyber resiliency. Additionally, on September 14th, OMB actually issued a memo on enhancing the security of the software supply chain through secure software development practices. Uh, the directive calls for agencies to use software built with common cybersecurity practices. The memo was issued under President Biden's May 2021 cybersecurity executive order, and it will require federal agencies to use a standardized self-attestation form consistent with NIST software supply chain security guidance before using a vendor software. The memo also set new deadlines for federal agencies. So within 90 days, agencies must inventory all software and create a separate inventory for critical software. Within 120 days, agencies have to develop consistent processes for communicating relevant requirements and collecting letters of attestation from software providers. And within 180 days, agency CIOs must assess organizational training needs and develop training plans for the review and validation of attestation. So I look forward to watching the progress that will come from this. To wrap up our conversation, I'd like to talk about our upcoming event, Cyberscape Zero Trust, which will be in person on September 29th in Tysons, Virginia. We've got some truly amazing speakers on our panels, including leaders from across government and industry. Kate and Sarah, what are you looking forward to at the event? I'm actually really excited to moderate the fireside chat with CISA's Associate Director for Vulnerability Management, Jay Gasley, because it's all about the strong data management and data governance foundation you need to have before you can even think about zero trust. And I think that's an aspect of the zero trust conversation that hasn't really been talked about a whole lot yet. And I'm really, really excited to dig into that because because the foundation of zero trust is knowing who or what is connected to your network, right? And who or what has access to certain data or who has certain privileges to manage access to that data. Like you have to know, like you have to be able to see everything. You have to be able to know what all your assets are before you can even start thinking about limiting access or sorting people based on like what they're allowed to access and stuff like that. So before you can even like get to determining data access privileges and managing user identities, you have to manage your data. Like you have to tag it, you have to sort it, you have to decide who should have access to what and why. You have to have common data standards across your organization. Like that's all like very foundational stuff. And it's something I think a lot of people don't really think about when they're talking about zero trust. And so I'm really interested to get Jay's perspective on all of that and how data management and data governance is important for Zero Trust. That sounds like it'll be a great conversation. I look forward to uh, listening to it. So I am excited for our SBOMs and software security panel. Uh, going off of what I was talking about earlier, there have been a couple new directives and memos that are coming out uh, that are creating new guidelines and federal agencies are, you know, within the next 90 days expected to make new changes. Uh, so my panel will feature Phil Stupak, Director of Federal Cybersecurity within the Office of the National Cyber Director, and Natalia Martin, Acting Director of the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence at NIST. I'm also really looking forward to Kurt Delbeni's closing fireside chat. I'm hoping to learn more about the agency's Zero Trust First cybersecurity strategy, which they just recently announced like in the past month, as well as how he plans to bolster the federal cybersecurity workforce. 
It sounds like it's going to be a fantastic event. There's still time to register for Cyberscape Zero Trust. So visit our website, govciomedia.com, for more information. We'll be back in two weeks for a recap of Cyberscape Zero Trust, along with a discussion of our next virtual event, Cyberscape Data and Automation Security. We look forward to that conversation. But until then, that's all for today's Flywheel Fridays. If you enjoyed this episode, keep the conversation turning by subscribing and leaving a review on the podcast platform of your choice. I'm Alexander Bulova. I'm Kate Macri. I'm Sarah Seibert. Thank you for listening. Flywheel Fridays, along with GovCast, HealthCast, and CyberCast, is a production of GovCIO Media and Research. For more podcasts and to check out the other shows, head to govciomedia.com. Watch out for new episodes released weekly across our shows. You can follow all of them in your favorite podcast platform. And if you like what you heard, make sure to let us know by leaving a review. And if you have any topics you think we should look into, contact us at newsletter at govcio.com.